Welcome to lecture three, part B on accounting analysis. In part A, we learned that sometimes accounting can be distorted or biased and the financial statements don't reflect the underlying economic reality of the business. In part B, we're gonna learn how we can conduct an accounting analysis to try and uncover any of these potential issues. So what we're gonna learn is a six step process as outlined in the textbook that we can follow through to help us structure the accounting analysis to try and focus on the most important places where there's likely to be biased accounting and the most important material accounts within a particular firm. So the first step in our accounting analysis is to identify key accounting policies. And this is gonna be probably our most easy or simple step. What we're gonna to do to identify key accounting policies is we're gonna open up our company's financial statements we're going to look at the income statement and the balance sheet. And then on the income statement and balance sheet, we're going to look for the most important numbers or the accounts with the highest, largest values so that we can identify which are the ones that really drive the reported performance of the business. So generally for key accounting policies, you're going to look at the revenue recognition on the income statement, maybe the cost of sales or one or two other expenses that are really large for your business. Then on the balance sheet, you'll look at a couple of the largest assets and a couple of the largest liability accounts and have, an, have a look at those in more detail. So identifying key accounting policies, we look at our financial statements, we look for the big numbers, the largest accounts that are going to really drive the reported performance. The second step will require a little bit of our knowledge from accounting standards and regulations. We need to be able to identify any flexibility in those reported figures. So once we've identified the large and material accounts for a business, we need to look at what are the accounting rules? What are we allowed to do when reporting on those figures? Is there a wide variety of choice on how to report our revenue or do we have to follow one specific method? So we need to identify the flexibility and assess whether our business is using that flexibility to reflect the underlying business or maybe to bias away from the underlying business reality. So every business, every industry will follow different accounting standards. We need to look at the key accounting standards that are related to our key accounting policies and identify what flexibility the business actually has to begin with. Step three is where things start to get a little bit more interesting. Step three is to evaluate your firm's accounting strategy. So because in step one, we've identified the key accounting policies, in step two, we've identified what flexibility the firms have. Now we have to think about, are they utilizing that flexibility for good or for evil? So you need to be able to consider what is normal for your particular firm's industry and for your particular firm's business strategy. So that might mean that we have to go and look at some competitors' financial statements and evaluate, is our business doing things in a similar manner or are we doing things very differently? Now, different is not always bad, but you need to understand why your firm is doing things differently if there are differences involved. Then we need to evaluate, do the managers have incentives to bias or manipulate the financial statements? In part A of the lecture, we discussed a whole range of reasons why managers might have, may have biased accounting financial statements. So check out if managers have any of those particular incentives to manipulate. We're going to look through all the notes to our financial statements here, and we're going to see if the firm's made any large changes recently. And are those changes explainable or are they unexplainable and a little bit suspicious? So we need to evaluate not only what the policy is today, but has it changed dramatically from prior years accounting statements. Then the last point here is whether there are any transactions that seem to be structured in unusual ways and if they're done in particular ways just to change the financial reporting. So often due to tax accounting, related party transactions, mergers and acquisitions, some transactions may be structured unusually. So we need to evaluate if there's anything like that in our statements. Are there any things that we don't quite understand what the accounting means for our firm? Let's do a little example. We're going to look at Qantas's financial statements and we're just going to quickly go through those first three steps. So this is Qantas's income statement for 2018. And the first step in our accounting analysis is to identify any key policies. So when we look at the income statement, the net passenger revenue is clearly a really important number. We're going to have to identify the revenue recognition for passenger revenue as one of Qantas's key policies. Then as we look at the expenses, how they account for their wages, their manpower, their fuel, and their aircraft operating variable costs are also going to be really important. Maybe even depreciation would be 
a key policy here because it does represent quite a significant portion of their revenues. Next, we're going to look at Qantas's balance sheet. And again, we're going to identify the key policies. So obviously, property, plant and equipment is one of Qantas's really large assets. So we're going to really spend some time analyzing their property, plant and equipment. How do they account for that? And that will require looking at note 10 and reading more information about that. So when we open up note 10, our property, plant and equipment note, we can see, for example, the aircraft and engines item is really the big asset within their property, plant and equipment. We've got their opening value, any additions during the year, any changes to the accounts, depreciation expense, leading to a closing net book value. And we know that this includes finance leased assets. Okay, so we can start to think about how they're recording the value of their aircraft. Is the depreciation rate accurate or reasonable compared to other firms in the industry? Does it make sense how they're doing things? So further notes on how they've recognized their property, plant and equipment, including how they've depreciated their different assets, including aircraft spare parts, 15 to 20 years, freighter aircraft and engines, 2.5 to 20 years. So there's a wide variety here. Now we can't say if it's good or bad straight up, we'd have to think about how long do we actually expect to use aircraft for? Does it reflect the actual usage of the planes in the depreciation schedule? Does it match what other competitors in the airline industry are doing? So to summarize, we could come up with a little table like this for an account. And this is a way that many students do present their accounting analysis for the first three steps. We've said that we've identified property, plant and equipment is a key item on Qantas's balance sheet. We've discussed how it's recorded. We've briefly discussed which accounting standards Qantas have to follow, so the flexibility. And then step three, we might compare to competitors to see if it's different to industry norms. We might try and think about if Qantas seems to be accounting in a way that is transparent and accurate, or if they're hiding information and making things difficult for us to understand. You do not have to do your accounting analysis this way, but it is a simple, straightforward way of presenting your research for steps one, two, and three for a particular account. The fourth step is to evaluate the quality of disclosure of your firm. So evaluating the quality of disclosure is important because we need to go, okay, the accounting statements don't tell us everything about a business, but do the managers give us other information, whether it's in the notes to the financial statements or elsewhere in the annual report or in other reports released to the market? Do we get a good understanding of what's actually going on in this business from management? So first of all, do the disclosures seem adequate? Do we get a good understanding of what this business is doing, what their uh, operational situation actually is from the financial statements, notes, and other company disclosure? Do we get enough information in the footnotes? Do we believe the company's giving us information that's required or are they withholding certain key pieces of information? Whether gap reflects or restricts the appropriate measurement of key measures of success is important. We learned previously that sometimes the accounting standards prevent businesses from recording what's actually happening in their business, such as research and development has to be expensed. Spending money on advertising and improving your brand is an expense, even though they do actually create value for your business and are similar to how some other assets may be recorded. So the accounting rules can perhaps restrict the measurement of success in your firm. One thing that would be really good to look at is does your firm report non-GAAP earnings? Non-GAAP earnings refers to when businesses often in their press releases will come up with their own measure of performance. They may call it something like underlying profit, which is not in the accounting standards, and they make their own changes to the reports. They say the accounting rules don't really reflect what's happening in our business, so we're coming up with our own rule system and we're going to report our performance. Check out if your firm's reporting numbers like that and see the difference. Look at the reconciliation between the real reported statutory or the legal net profit and the non-GAAP. That's a good way of looking at the disclosure, getting an idea if the firm thinks the accounting standards actually reflect what's going on. Some businesses have multiple segments and sometimes companies don't like giving up much information on those segments. To value a company that is operating in different industries across different markets, you need that information. So analyze if you're getting good segment information to actually see what's happening in the various parts of the business. I just mentioned non-GAAP earnings and non-GAAP earnings refers to companies reporting their own non-legal profit figures normally or other measures of performance. This business here, McPherson's, List, uh, McPherson's Limited, 
In their financial highlights in their annual report, they said they had an increase in underlying profit before tax from continuing operations from 16.2 to 19 million. Now, when we learned what the income statement was and what they look like in accounting A and accounting B, we never learned the term underlying profit before tax from continuing operations. That's because it's not part of the accounting standards. It's not part of the accounting rules. McPherson's have made up this measure themselves to try and make themselves look better. So their actual profit from continuing operations before income tax was about 17 million. But in their report, they refer to underlying profit and they say they earned 19 million. This does not equal what's in the actual financial statements because they've decided to make their own adjustments to it. And then when we actually look at their real profit or loss for the year, it's only about 5 million. Very, very different from the 19 million that they're claiming they earned. They have removed the loss from discontinued operations. So part of their business has been making a loss. And instead of talking about that and saying, we only made 5 million profit because part of our business was loss making, they've said, let's ignore the part we've made a loss on. We've sold off that business, so it's not going to affect us in the future. Just pretend that never happened, and let's look at the rest of the business, which did make $19 million. So they're claiming that part of their business performance isn't relevant to the future, so you should ignore that, and they've come up with their own measure called underlying profit. Many firms do that. They'll use terms that are quite vague. For example, cash profit, which doesn't mean anything in accounting, but companies, especially the banks, will talk about their cash profits. It's not their cash flow, it's not their accounting profit, it's their own made up number. Check out these disclosures and see what they've done. They do have to provide a reconciliation from this number to this number and how they've come up with it. Step five is the potential red flags in your business. The potential red flags are the key points where you think maybe this company's doing something wrong. This is the step that's gonna require the most research on your part. It's gonna require the most effort because to be honest, most of us won't find many red flags in our assignment. The companies we're analyzing are probably doing their accounting pretty accurately. So most of you won't find any obvious red flags, but you need to show that you've looked for them. So you need to discuss things like, were there any unexplained changes in accounting, especially if their performance has been decreasing and suddenly they've changed their accounting? Have they changed any policies or estimations or forecasts within their accounting figures? Have they had any unexplained transactions? Have they suddenly spun out different parts of their business or engaged in mergers and acquisitions that have suddenly changed the performance a lot? A lot of accounting tricks can be hidden when we have mergers and acquisitions, so check out if any of those things have occurred. Have we had increases in inventory or receivables in relation to our sales revenue? So we could just do some ratio analysis over time to see if these relations are maintaining consistency or if they're changing. If our business is now holding much more inventory compared to previous years, maybe that's because we're not selling our inventory and we've got obsolete inventory on our books. That's not a good thing if we've got lots of old inventory we didn't sell. Likewise, if our receivables is increasing faster than sales, that might indicate we're selling more on credit and would hopefully see a larger allowance for bad debt. If the business hasn't increased their bad debt expense or allowances, that might also be a sign of aggressive accounting. So what we need to do is we need to look at our firm's accounting. We need to calculate different ratios over time, see if any of the accounts are changing dramatically year to year. Does that change make sense? Has the economy, business or strategy changed that leads to changes in those accounts? Or does it look like the firm is simply changing their accounting estimations? Other things would be, has the business had any large asset write-offs or do you think they should have large asset write-offs? For example, have other members of the firm's industry been writing off assets that are now out of date and your firm's not doing that? That could be a red flag. We definitely need to look at the audit report and I'll come back to that later. Check out if your firm's got a qualified audit report or if they have received a going concern opinion. Related party transactions are also going to be something important. If there's large related party transactions disclosed in the financial statements, often they can be a little bit suspicious. So it's worth checking out the governance of the firm, what sort of checks and balances have been put in place before related party transactions have occurred. So overall, identifying potential red flags is difficult. For many of you, you won't find any obvious problems with your firm's accounting. And that's a good sign because remember, most firms do their accounting with the best intentions and it's going to be reasonably accurate. 
but we still need to check. So for your assignments purposes, go through and compare ratios for your firm compared to other firms in the industry. Check your firm's accounting compared to industry competitors and see if there's any unique differences or changes over time that may not make sense to you. They would then be things that you discuss as potential red flags. And finally, step six is to undo any accounting distortions. If you do find any problems with the firm's accounting, you can undo those distortions. And that means there's usually going to be an income statement effect and a balance sheet effect. And you've got to try and think about how you would undo those effects on your financial statements so that when you then do your ratio analysis and forecasting, you're removing out any problems with the accounting. So as a little example, let's take the company Zero, and Zero have capitalized their development costs for their software. Now you are allowed to capitalize development costs under certain situations. And there are certain situations when you can't capitalize development costs. So Xero have capitalized their development costs, which means their software development has been recorded as an asset on their balance sheet. Now, I'm not saying that Xero have done this incorrectly. I'm just saying if you believed they had done this incorrectly, you could reverse this out from the notes, from the information contained in the notes to the financial statements. So we've got our software development, which is an asset on their balance sheet because they've capitalized it. In total, they have 239,000 with three extra zeros, so that's 239 million, of which they have got accumulated amortization with a net book value of 139,000. If we thought that this was done incorrectly, we would have to lower our asset value by 139,000. We would have to remove this asset from our books because we thought it was developed or capitalized incorrectly. We would also then say, well, during the year, they recorded an amortization expense of 45,000. If we're removing the total cost, we would also have to remove this amortization expense. And during the year, any extra additions, this is new money spent on the software, that would have to be recorded as an expense in the period in which we spent it. So we would have to include this number as an expense this year, we would have to remove this asset amount from our balance sheet, and would have to remove this expense from our profit and loss statement. Okay, so it would lead to big changes in the financial statements. We would reduce the assets, the equity, equity would be reduced as well. The amortization expense would be reduced, which increases profit. But then this year's expense would be increased and profit would be adjusted down. So it would all still balance, our balance sheet would still balance, our profit and loss statement would make sense, but it would reflect the fact that we disagreed with some of their accounting choices. So to summarize the different types of distortions and biases that accounting has, this slide shows if we have asset distortions. So let's have a look here. If we have an asset that is overstated, originally, so when we first have the overstated asset, an example would be failing to write down obsolete inventory. My store has a warehouse full of inventory, which is very old and it's obsolete and I'm not gonna be able to sell it for as much as it's valued on my balance sheet. That would lead to earnings being overstated because under the correct accounting, I should record an inventory impairment. An inventory impairment is an expense which lowers my profit. If I do not do that and I maintain my asset value too high, that is my asset is overstated, my earnings will be overstated. Years go by and eventually we decide that we actually are going to write down the obsolete inventory value. So a couple of years later, we record an inventory impairment, which means we record a expense, which lowers our profit. So in that later year, our true economic earnings would be understated because we're reflecting this expense that actually happened years ago. So when we subsequently write down the inventory, our true earnings would be understated because the expense is being recognized years later. Okay, that would be reversing the original mistake. On the other side, you might have an asset that is understated originally, and that would lead to your earnings being understated as well. So an example for this would be a pharmaceutical company that is doing research and development, and they're actually ticking the boxes for this drug to be developed. So the development costs can be put as an asset. They can be capitalized under certain circumstances. If we incorrectly expensed these development costs, it would lead to our earnings being understated because we're recording expenses, development expense, rather than the development cost being put as an asset. So in the short term, it would lead to an earnings understatement because we understated our assets. Over time, 
As we realize the benefits from the R&D expenditure, if we reverse this transaction, the earnings would then be overstated. Over time, the earnings will be overstated because we won't have any amortization or depreciation expense lowering the profits because we already expensed off the cost of developing the product many years ago. So in future years, we then are not matching the expense, the depreciation or amortization with the actual income or revenue creation at that point in time. So that would lead in future years to our earnings being higher than would be economically realistic. In discussing asset distortions and looking at red flags in businesses, it's often quite difficult to actually do. But as I said, we need to look at our company, think about what's logical for them compared to different industries. And we might get situations like this. ASIC confirms a role in Meyer's 515 million intangible asset impairments. Meyer is a department store that for many years have been in a lot of financial trouble and they had a lot of goodwill on their balance sheet. And ASIC have now admitted, this is in 2018, that they encouraged Meyer to impair this asset. ASIC, the Australian Securities Investment Commission, is a regulator and they didn't believe Meyer's accounting was accurate or realistic. So they encouraged Meyer to lower their goodwill number on their balance sheet, which is an impairment. When Meyer engaged with this impairment, it led to a massive expense that year, which meant they reported a huge loss. Now, how do we know that Meyer's goodwill is overstated? ASIC get all sorts of extra private information that we don't get. Well, this happened in 2018. And one of the first years that I ever tutored FSA was back in 2011. And let's have a look at Meyer's balance sheet back then. If we look at their assets, their tangible assets, about 1.1 billion, which was about equal to their liabilities. Their liabilities were a little bit higher than their tangible assets, but then they had a lot of goodwill, their brands. Now this analysis was from 2011, seven years before ASIC forced Meyer to impair their goodwill asset. And this analyst here, we've got the website down there, it says that Meyer has a huge amount of goodwill on its balance sheet versus David Jones. So let's look at David Jones's balance sheet. They only have 35 million of goodwill compared to Meyer's 900 million of goodwill. These are very similar businesses operating in very similar industries with similar business models. David Jones was earning a higher return on equity, a higher return on their assets compared to Meyer, but Meyer claimed they had much more goodwill. Doesn't quite make sense. So seven years ago, people in their assignments for this FSA subject, similar assignment, were able to identify, looking at the two competitors, that Meyer's balance sheet was probably overstated. The goodwill should be impaired. They didn't really have that much goodwill in their business. And it took many, many years for the regulator to actually force them to lower that. So it is possible with good industry analysis, looking at the key numbers on the balance sheets, comparing them against different firms to find things that stick out and maybe don't make sense. So good assignments for that particular year suggested that Meyer's assets were overstated. Maybe they could have uh, lowered them with some undoing of distortions and figured it out, or at least they just discussed it as a potential issue, a potential red flag there. Okay, so it is possible to identify problems with big, large listed companies that have reputable auditors. It is possible to do. To summarize what liability distortions look like and do to our income statement, First of all, if we have a liability overstatement, that's going to result in earnings being understated. So let's say originally we're running a construction company and we've got a multi-year project. Instead of recording revenue using the percentage of completion method, imagine we just wait until the project is fully completed before we record our revenue. That would be excessive revenue deferral. We're deferring our revenue until the project is complete. So in the short term, we will have higher liabilities and we won't be recording any revenues. So we'll have understated net profits. Then a couple of years later, when we finish the project and we record all the revenue, we're gonna have a much higher revenue leading to an earnings overstatement in the year that all the revenue is recorded. So that will reverse out any prior or original decisions. On the other side of the liability spectrum, if we understate our liabilities originally, for example, if we have employees who we have promised to pay a retirement income to, but if we haven't put it as a provision and a liability that we're saving or recording this liability as the employee works for us, then we would be 
failing to accrue future retirement benefits, it would be understating liabilities today, which would overstate our earnings. Because instead of today recording some sort of future salary or retirement expense, we just ignore it and we understate our liabilities. Then a couple of years later, our employee retires and we keep paying them a salary. That means that in those future years, our earnings would be understated. We should have recorded a provision previously, some sort of long service leave or retirement provision previously. Now we're not doing it, but we're still paying them out the cash. So our earnings would be understated in those future years because the actual economic transaction that leads to the employee who's retired being paid today occurred over previous years. This year they're getting their cash, but the actual economic transaction, there's no matching between when this expense was incurred and when it actually happened. So subsequent recognition of retirement benefits would understate earnings in the future. In getting towards a conclusion for accounting analysis, conservative accounting is often a good thing. We don't want our companies to be bragging and overly optimistic and recording profits too early, but it's not always a good thing to be conservative. If we have land that's 50 years old, that's still valued at a historic cost, very reliable number, not very relevant. So conservative accounting is not always good, but often we do prefer it over overly optimistic. So there are issues with that. And likewise, not all unusual accounting is going to be wrong. So just because your company is doing things different to the rest of the industry, you then need to think about, do we have a different business model or are there logical reasons why the accounting looks different? If not, then we identify some red flags and maybe think about the issues, but not everything that's different is unusual. Companies like Apple and Google still generate high returns for their investors. It may look like they've got a smaller asset base because they can't capitalize all of their real assets, but their profits or their earnings still have to be real. So all it'll show up is a higher return on their assets. So when we see headlines like this, beware that people who are saying the accounting isn't useful at all will often lead you down to incorrect conclusions. But we also, on the other hand, have to recognize that Assets and balance sheets are not perfect in capturing some of these new technology assets as well. To finish up, especially this year, I want you all for your assignment to double check the audit reports. If your company has released any half yearly financial statements during the next few months as we're doing our assignments or financial reports, of course, check the audit report. Rugby Australia for you sports fans, they had their annual general meeting earlier in the week and they were unable to actually release their financial statements because the auditors wouldn't sign off on it. The auditors wouldn't sign off on the financial statements because there was so much uncertainty about whether the organization will be able to continue into the future. That is, they weren't sure if they were going to be a going concern. So the audit of its 2019 financial records was unable to be completed amid the coronavirus pandemic. They were unable to publish their annual report. Okay. Auditing can be halted in the instance of an event that might have a significant financial impact. Please check your firm's audit reports, see if the auditors have had any problems with the firm's accounting. Finally, some concluding comments. Accounting analysis is essential when we're valuing a business using financial standards. We know that sometimes the accounting for firms is completely wrong. In those cases, we want to check out and see if it's wrong. Can we uncover any areas where it's particularly problematic? We've presented a six step methodology for conducting accounting analysis to help you have a framework for the steps to go through. Obviously, some of those steps are very easy, like step one, identifying key policies. You don't have to think much about that. But then step five, that's starting to get a little bit harder when we're actually trying to identify the red flags that a business may face. Do your best. Put in as much research as you can, look at your firm, the ratios, the figures that are reported, compare it to industry averages or the competitors, look for any differences over time or any particular year. And that will show us that research so that even if you don't find any red flags, you can show us where you have looked. That's really key to show us that you've looked for the red flags, even if you didn't find any. So in conclusion, this week we've learned about accounting analysis. Next week, after we trust our accounting, we're going to use the financial statements. We're going to reformat them. We're going to classify all our transactions as either operating or financial transactions, which will then allow us to really uncover the value that businesses create. Thank you very much.